Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for making time to be here tonight. Uh, those who are still on the way, I can see a few people still coming, will just have to uh, join us. Um, thank you for being here this evening to be here for what promises to be a very interesting talk. Uh, the talk will be given by Dr. Sipo Gazimakata, who will speak for 30 minutes. The title of the talk is Yayili Kaeshalendo Aitetwa. It was time, it was a time of that which could not pass your lips. Women combatants in the armed struggle against apartheid. In this talk, Dr. Magadha will be writing women back into, writing women back into history and politics. Disciplines in which, because of the dominant theories and concepts that are used, women tend to be left out. The discussant, the person who will be responding in dialogue to Dr. Sipo Magadha is Ms. Makosa Zanakaba. Ms. Makosa Zanakaba is a writer and former combatant of Mkunto with Sizwe. She will respond to um, the talk as she'll take 10 minutes responding to the talk. The other discussant is Ms. Lindy Wemdambo, who's an honors candidate in the politics department. Lindy Wem's response will also be 10 minutes. Welcome. Hello. This evening, uh, it being the last week of the semester of the term, uh, we're very thankful that um, you were able to make it. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Snorikolo for agreeing to chair this uh, discussion and for partnering with the politics department uh, for this conversation. Uh, the Office of Equity and Institutional Culture is the reason that we're able to get uh, Makoseza Naklaba in Grahamstown from Johannesburg. I would also like to thank uh, Babalwa Gusha and um, Lutando Somgesi, who, were, who assisted, assisted us with the administrative um, arrangements that made all of this possible. And I would also uh, importantly like to thank Kositaba uh, and Lundi uh, Wemtambo for agreeing to be part of this conversation. I submitted my PhD in December last year, uh, which for me, uh, and within the um, country's calendar was a very important year, especially for the armed struggle. Last year was the 55th anniversary of the founding of Mkondo Sizwe and the founding of Boko, uh, or the uh, Azanian People's Liberation Army, APLA. But it seems to me that the 55th anniversary of the armed struggle, uh, which followed um, after the liberation movements were banned by the apartheid state following the Shavu massacre, didn't really take um, a lot of, occupy a lot of public discussion in terms of the meanings of the uh, armed struggle and the legacies of the armed struggle in contemporary South Africa. Part of that, I think it is because 2016 was a very busy year in terms of uh, commem commemorating important events. Last year was, of course, the 20th anniversary of the first TRC hearings in East London. Last year was also the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Constitution. It was also the 40th anniversary of the 1976 student uprisings. It was the 60, 60th anniversary of the Women's March to Pretoria. It was also the 10th anniversary of the Jacob Zuma rape trial. So in many ways, <laughs> it was a very busy year. Um, the only event that I remember where the armed struggle occupied uh, significance was only in November uh, at the WITS conference uh, with, with the theme, um, Struggles in Southern Africa. 
But it seems to me, though, that the armed struggle is showing up in South Africa uh, in multiple and interesting ways. One of those ways is through the publication of several books um, that are examining the legacy of the ANC in exile. Uh, some of those books look at the use of torture by the ANC. Um, and some of those books also examine how the history of the ANC, in particular in exile, has shaped the behavior uh, of the ruling uh, of, of the party in power. I will be speaking to some of those books shortly. But the armed struggle has also showed up in the student movements, um, specifically through the body of Solomon Mashangu. The armed struggle has shown up through the body of Chris Hani, and in some ways, the only woman that I see in the public imagination showing up is Winnie Madigizala Mandela. Largely, it seems to me that the public conception of the armed struggle is a very masculine one. So one gets the idea that it was the men like Hani and uh, Mashangu through their, the sacrifice of their own bodies that won the war on behalf of women and children. But I will argue today that women in South Africa across time, across different periods of struggle, and women of different ages were foundational to the defeat of apartheid. Part of that, I will argue, is because the nature of the war itself was in the home or in the private spaces where women um, uh, are, 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 are dominant in a sense. Um, and so in some ways, I also want to suggest that he, the different bodies of Hani, Masangu and Majigizela Mandela, also speak to the different uh, nature of the armed struggle as well as the unconventional nature of the war itself. But for myself, how I came to think about this research, to be interested in the question of combatants and the well-being of combatants um, after 1994 was really when the Jacob Zuma administration, um, uh, uh, what is it, founded the Department of Military Veterans. It was as if it was out of nowhere in 2009. In South Africa, we were introduced to the Department of Defense and Military Veterans. And this is the department that is tasked then with looking uh, at the welfare of combatants, uh, economically, socially, and also ensuring that those who fought in the armed struggle are remembered um, in the liberation history. But part of the founding of this Department of Military Veterans, it seems to me, was that it was also a reaction to the reality and to some of the research that came out, um, that has come out criticizing the integration process of the South African National Defense Force. Many people don't know that the South African National Defense Force was founded at midnight on the 27th of April in 1994. And the task of the South African Defense Force was to bring together the old South African Defense Force and the defense forces of the, Bantu, of the Bantu stands, as well as including the non-statutory forces of MK and APLA. So altogether, the task of founding of the South African Defense Force was the coming together of seven armies, some statutory, some non-statutory. So there was a, a, a recognition that that process had its own limitations because due to its size, the, the defense force going into a democratic South Africa had to be narrowed. It had to be um, uh, minimized in a sense. So while other departments in the country, be it health, be it, be it education, had to accommodate the new black majority, the defense force had to be cut down um, as a way of moving into a democratic South Africa that was less militarized than the apartheid states. So through that process, some people got lost um, and were not recognized by the state. And there's a sense that a lot, a number of the former combatants uh, in the majority, they are poor, they are uneducated, and some of them, because of their military training, are presenting a potential threat to the state 
because of this military training. And it seemed to me that some of that anxiety was coming out of what military veterans were doing in places like Zimbabwe, in places like Mozambique, in places like Namibia. So in some ways, I was looking at the founding of the Department of Military Veterans as a reaction to the limitations of the integration of the, South, of the new defense force, and also then responding to anxieties about what combatants can do or, or what kind of um, security uh, threat they can possess or pose to the state if the state doesn't look after them. But in looking at that, I was then uh, quite struck by how, uh, in the main, when uh, in, there was talk about the military veterans and combatants, most of the combatant in our imagination and in policy is a focus on the male combatant. So I came then to this thesis work uh, wanting to find out what, how have women who did not integrate into the new defense force how are they doing in post-apartheid South Africa? But I also then wanted to evaluate more broadly what the state is doing, has done, and uh, is doing for combatants as a category more broadly. And I also then wanted to examine uh, in what ways are women present in those state processes. But also then understand uh, women's combated experiences of integration beyond the state. So that's how I come into this research. So in attempting then to find out how women combatants are faring in post-apartheid South Africa, I then uh, encountered a dilemma. I had gone to this research assuming that if I am looking at a combatant, I would obviously be looking at the women who fought along MK and APLA. But when I went to the different um, uh, parties with the ANC or APLA and the uh, formations that were inside the country, such as the self-defense units, I was then pointed to different kinds of combatants. So for one, in 2012, while I was working on my proposal, I was observing um, uh, workshops, narrative workshops that were being conducted by Janet Cherry. Janet Cherry is at NMMU. She has written a book on MK, and she did her PhD on uh, 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 the role of civic movements in Kwazakele in the 1980s. So I observed those workshops and how the men and women of Amabuto were making a claim that even they, they were combatants because they were the ones who were facing the apartheid police and army in the townships in Kwazakele, in New Brighton, all over Port Elizabeth. And when I went to APLA offices, uh, PAC offices, in places like um, East London and Umtata, I was then directed to women who fought for the PAC in the 1960s, when they were contesting the institution of the Bantu Authorities Act. So in some ways then, my own sample resembles the very different uh, uh, multiple kinds of combatants that came out of the South African War for Liberation. And in fundamental ways then, the attempting to understand who is a South African combatant uh, forced me to ask what kind of war was fought in South Africa. Because unlike the cases of Zimbabwe, kinds cases of Mozambique, we don't speak of South Africa as a post-war society. It seems to me that when we speak of the struggle, it is not immediately clear that we are talking about war. And I think part of that, and some scholars have argued, that the negotiation process, the pr transition to democratic South Africa, uh, was also significant in undermining the legacy of the war against apartheid. In some ways, then, others have asked, if South Africa doesn't admit that it was in a war, how can we then talk about war veterans or combatants? So for me, the critical part then what looking at women has allowed me to do is to come into reality with the nature of the war that was fought in South Africa. So in total then, I had interviewed 36 women. I, I went all over 
the Eastern Cape, and I wanted to prioritize the Eastern Cape because a lot of the studies that have been conducted in this country have been in places like Durban, in Gauteng, and in Cape Town. So without a car, I relied on public transport to uh, travel to PE, Umtata, uh, East London, and I finished my interviews in Gauteng. And I also interviewed some officials in the Department of Military Veterans. So in unpacking and in, in thinking about the combatant itself uh, and revisiting then the nature of the war in South Africa, it became clear, it's, um, there's a sense in the literature that South Africa falls along the cases or the experiences of guerrilla war. By that I mean that South Africa was not involved in what are known as old or classic wars in international relations theory that rely on the work of Clausewitz. Because here, the argument is that whereas the experiences in Europe, for example, were that there was the uh, war basically meant the confrontation of two armies or multiple armies, the experiences of liberation movements in the global south has been such that it, um, the liberation movements have been able to see that they do not have enough material power to confront colonial forces. So the work of Mao Zedong, the work of Che Guevara in Cuba shows that the nature of war in much of the global south is what is categorized as unorthodox or unconventional war. And that in some ways South Africa falls within that tradition because from the beginning, from early on, both the ANC and APLA recognized that they did not have enough material power to confront the South African Defense Force. So the ideas around then guerrilla war is that the guerrilla army must be in close relation with, with the population that it seeks to liberate. And what that does then in our own thinking about war is that it blares these distinctions around who is the combatant and who is a civilian. It blares the distinction around our own ideas about who is, what, what then is the battlefront and what is the home front. Guerrilla war erases those lines. And the South African experience points to that in intimate ways. So talking about the inspiration of South Africa, even in the early documents of the ANC, the ANC compared its experience to those of Cuba. Howard Barrell says that the ANC was inspired by the experience of Algeria, the experiences of in China, in Greece, in Vietnam, in Yugoslavia. And that in part, the ANC also realized that the only way to defeat the apartheid state would be to have the armed struggle not being the main uh, ways in which it confronts the states, but that they would need to use different strategies. Gwandi and Gwandi's book, uh, In the Twilight of the Revolution, in the, uh, 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 a book about the PAC, also shows that the PAC was awake to those realities. But the focus of the PAC was mainly the rural, uh, the rural peasantry. That they recognized that what the armed struggle needed to do then was to work in close relation with the peasantry in order to defeat apartheid. And this was happening in multiple ways in terms of contesting Bantu authorities, um, contesting pass laws, and all the uh, uh, invasions of the apartheid states mainly in the areas that became known as the Bantu stands. So in some ways then, when Stephen Ellis argues that the war in South Africa, uh, the war that South Africa experienced was a late 20th century war, a civil war that was, that was fought among the people. It is then unsurprising um, that scholars have um, sort of reach that conclusion. In, in, in a sense, there's no contestation around the fact that the war itself was unconventional. Furthermore, building on this idea around uh, the nature of the war itself, people like Jacqueline Koch have argued that the adoption of the people's war strategy by the ANC in the 1980s 
further complicated uh, ideas around who is a combatant and the, and the space where the war itself was fought. Because if the ANC was inviting all black people to see themselves as combatants, how do we then, in post-apartheid South Africa, begin to make choices around who fits more as a combatant and who, uh, in the terrain of the, uh, 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 what is it, in, uh, uh, the state of emergencies, when black people were running away from bullets, bullets in every space in their society, how do we then decide around the definition of a combatant? So even people like Pamela Reynolds, whose work has been around the role of the youth in places like Zuele Temba, in Worcester, in Cape Town, part of that work has been to say that a lot of young people uh, sacrifice their lives challenging apartheid security forces. S many of those people, known at that time as young lions, are today not recognized as combatants, yet the heart of the war itself was in the township, was in the Bantustans, and of course was around all over southern Africa in, the, uh, in terms of the presence of the SNDF in Namibia, in Angola, and the uh, reality that the apartheid state went around southern Africa hunting down uh, liberation fi uh, fighters in Swaziland, in Lesotho, in Botswana, and so forth. So the work of Deborah Bonin has been very useful to me, and her work focuses on the violence in KZN, uh, in terms of the role of the state, and of also the confrontation between the IFP and the ANC. And what Bonin argues is that the nature of the violence in KZN destabilized fixed cate categories of war, uh, and it also then destabilized our ideas about women's spaces and, and men's spaces. And to further complicate the, the matter further, part of the dilemma with defining South Africa as a post-war society is the fact that the apartheid state never admitted itself as being in a war. So people like Laura Nathan and Jacqueline Cork have argued that one of the reasons, one of the main reasons the apartheid state never said we are at a, in a war was to rob the liberation movements um, of the legal protections of international law that would be due to them if they were admitted as being in a war. So one of those is the protection of the torture convention. And of course the apartheid state used torture pervasively um, in, its, in, in its confrontation with liberation movements and calling them terrorists and calling what they were facing as a total onslaught. Theresa Edelman's work has also been useful for me because she says the apartheid state uh, invited all white South Africans to defend the nation. So while the ANC was saying this is a people's war, the practical realities of the total onslaught strategy was an invitation to white South Africans to defend the state. So the literature around the conscription of white males uh, often focuses on white males being sent to places like Namibia, to places like Angola. But she says a lot of those white males served in black townships. Right? So that was, a, and so in, of course then, it's again not surprising that the, the, even in the minds of white South Africans, they were in a war. Even Eugene de Kock admits this. Eugene de Kock in the book that is written by Pumla Koboto Madigizela, who interviewed Eugene de Kock for months. Eugene de Kock says, I have never been involved in a conventional war, but I have been, uh, I was close to it as you can get. But I can tell you that the dirtiest war we can ever get is the one fought in the shadows, and I was there in the middle of it. Eugene de Kock, of course, who um, was trained in places like Namibia, he was trained in Zimbabwe. Um, he was the one who led the apartheid uh, insurgency uh, unit known as FLAC Plus. Eugene de Kock was responsible for the unit that went around Southern Africa hunting down liberation activists. So 
The book by Jacob Lamini, Askari, uh, follows the, uh, the life of a former MK, Gloria Sedibe, who was captured in Swaziland by Eugene de Kock, tortured and then turned into an, uh, a National Party spy. That was the work of Eugene de Kock's flag pass. Uh, 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 and, 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 and it's no mistake that he says he, he was fully aware of what kind of war he was involved in. And people like Terence Ranger have argued that the Rhodesian army used similar strategies in training, um, uh, what is it, mainly police officers uh, to be able to carry out these counter-insurgency units. So the police officer who uh, said okay to the shooting of Hector Peterson was someone who was trained in Zimbabwe. So there are all of these connections around the regional nature of the war itself and the idea that even without admitting that they were in a war, by all intents and purposes, uh, the apartheid state understood itself to be in a war. So how do then women fit into this? Uh, so the literature in, I want to say the Euro-American literature, also in a sense follows the literature in IR around where war happens. And in those ideas around the separation of the battlefront and the home front, the separation of the civilian and the combatant, that separation, feminists have argued, uh, it, it is a gendered separation. Because there's an assumption that women are safely tucked away in the domestic front while the men go and fight the war on our behalf. So part of the work by feminists in international relations has been to undo that logic, to show that even in the Western reality, especially in the, 19th, uh, in the 20th century with the two world wars, there was an erasure of those categories around how war happened. Because for one, um, the, the number of casualties in wars outnumbers, uh, sorry, the number of civilian casualties in all wars outnumbers that of soldiers. So feminists have used those realities to show that war reconfigures all aspects of social life. That women contribute into the war economy in, in different ways. Um, some of them as military wives, some of them as sex uh, workers, but women's agency, even in these private spaces, is central to the upking, upkeeping of war. Uh, and that fundamentally, war reconfigures these spaces of social life. Feminists in the global south have shown that guerrilla war then makes those, that blurring of all of those lines even more obvious. So for one, the, one of the articles that is often uh, cited, of course, is uh, Anne McClintock's work around how black women come into the national liberation movement. Uh, because, of course, we know that uh, women in the ANC only get formal uh, membership in 1943. But that doesn't mean that women were not active until 1943. And, of course, she argues that women come into the forefront of the struggle in part because they were feeling the violence of apartheid. So the fact that the police were in schools, were in people's homes, as I will show, uh, brought women into the forefront of the struggle. So as others have argued that the site of the struggle itself shifted to the home and community in the spaces that are socially understood to be spaces that women occupy. And so the nature of the violence itself transformed women's relationship to violence. And I want to show that this does not only happen in the 80s, it happens throughout the uh, uh, confrontation and the struggle against apartheid. There's often an assumption that uh, the banning of the national liberation movements in the 1960s meant that black people were not active in both urban and rural spaces. The work, um, so Salim Badad's work around banishment has been quite useful to me in thinking about uh, 
what was happening in the Bantu stands, what was also happening in the 1960s. So one of the things that Badat argues is that the other difference between South Africa and Zimbabwe and Namibia and Mozambique is that the South African guerrilla struggle is essentially an urban guerrilla struggle. This is quite different to what happens in Cuba, what happens in China. Because there, the reliance was that the war starts from the, from the hinterlands. It starts from the rural areas moving into the city. And yet in South Africa, where we have seen the images of the Langa massacre, of the Soweto uprisings, all of those happen within the urban township space. And I suppose then I wonder if the nature of, that, of the guerrilla struggle, of the confrontation being so concentrated in the urban space is not also one of the reasons that South Africa then does not uh, see its health as having been in an actual war. It is a question mark. But the work of Govan Beggi, the work of Badat and others shows us that uh, rural residents were not passive recipients of apartheid legacy. So I, when I went to, when I was in East London, uh, looking, as, as, asking you know, for, for women who fought uh, for Porto, which then became APLA, uh, what the, con the councillor that I met in East London uh, gave me a number of a leader in, Cape, in, in, in Umtata, who then said, come through, I know some women. Uh, and I ended up then interviewing uh, women in their 80s who were in Mkanduli, in Umtata. And these were the women who were uh, active during the time when the trans guy, when people in the trans guy were contesting uh, the imposing of chiefs upon them. This was the confrontation between Matanzima and uh, Dalinjebo, Sabata Dalinjebo, that eventually led to Sabata Dalinjebo leaving the country to Zambia, if I remember correctly. So the members of the PAC, as people like Lord and others show, that the, 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 the PAC took the struggles of the uh, rural residents very seriously. So the women I spoke to uh, said that their husbands had been in Cape Town, where also Porto uh, had a stronghold. And in sharing ideas on what to do about these white people who are taking our lands, they pushed back. So there was incidences in 1962 where Keza Matanzima was almost killed by Porto members. In 1963, in Mkanduli, these women and men were arrested, confronting uh, white authorities. So when this woman said, um, you know, uh, uh, it was not only the, the question of chiefs, but there was an acknowledgement that the struggle is, big, is bigger. This is a struggle to gain back the land. So even in those days, there was that clarity and urgency. And the role, and I think this is an important because often then the role of women, even in the PAC, is not spoken of. And that in some ways, I want to suggest that the, there was no clear separation between the men and women who were in places like Cape Town or the rural areas. In some ways, the, 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 the struggle fed into each other. But of course then, uh, returning to the point around wars in the township, we see that in the 1980s, really from the uh, 70s and the 1980s, it heightens uh, that the township itself becomes a space of fear and as Koch argues, a zone of terror. That the clear uh, daily encounter with the hippos, with the apartheid state, made uh, South Africans in township feel the violence of the apartheid state. And so in, it's no mistake then that even the ANC recognized that they needed to work or, or, or uh, uh, recognize the, the potential of, the, uh, of, bl of black people in the urban area. And so what I'm trying to show here is that in these different spaces, uh, the, 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 the pressure of the state and the resistance to it was becoming more and more magnified. <laughs>
Am I running out of Oh my goodness. Okay, okay, I'll move fast. Uh, so in so there's a whole area of township studies uh, and, and and the civic movements that come out of the of of, 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 of townships all over the country. And PE was no different with the number of civic movements that came out of that space, uh, uh, such as Pe uh, PEPCO and the Women's Me Wing, which was the Port Elizabeth Women's Organization. And what surprised me in uh, uh, speaking to uh, the, the women uh, um, in PE was that when we talk about the state of emergencies or the violence in the 1980s, we often talk about the young males but we don't talk about the people that were protecting them. So the literature that comes, the, the, the narratives that come out of that is that these women, they were the ones who were offering their houses to these young men and women, and in doing so, putting themselves in the front line of the war. One of the women I spoke to said for a number of years she could not sleep uh, uh, in, in her bed. She had to sleep on the floor so that in the case that when a bullet came through, it didn't hit her. So these are the, the, the realities of what was happening in the townships in the, in the 1980s. And part, of, and part of that reality was that the women who were active in the civic movements were routinely uh, harassed by the police. So there were many cases of women who said they would come at midnight. One of them said, my father had to intervene because I was breastfeeding my baby while the police were coming to get me. Uh, and, part of, of, uh, and, uh, and, and, and part of that is this reality that uh, the attack uh, by the apartheid state was also the attack on the black family that children in schools, at homes, no one was safe. And so this narrative of um, Uma Mafuta, who talks about how uh, she, uh, in a sense, uh, the, 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 young, the young men uh, uh, and women but, uh, would come to a house uh, and, and how that put her in a, in a different, what is it, uh, in a confrontation with the local black officer who knew that she was protecting these young men. And I'll speak later about how this role around women protecting children uh, is important in terms of understanding the nature of the war itself that is often misunderstood in feminist um, literature about women in the liberation movement. So I'm trying to go fast. But in the main, the, what is written in South Africa about women and the armed struggle are the roles of the women who left the country to join MK and APLA. And as the work of Jacqueline Cox shows, uh, the number of women in MK increases in the 1980s. And I argue that part of this is because uh, of the increasing pressure by the state, that a lot of these young women felt that they had no option but to leave. Uh, but I also argue that young women had more liberties in terms of being able to leave the country more than older women who had children. Uh, and that is important to understand in terms of what kind of woman could go and join MK and what kind of woman had to stay in South Africa fighting inside the country. Uh, and so I argue that the MK space itself was uh, important or significant or accessible to a particular kind of woman uh, who is younger. And even in my sample, a lot of the women were people who were in their teenage years, a lot of them who had been active uh, as members of COSAS uh, in, the school, uh, in the school system, and some of them early uh, had just entered university. And so in some ways, the heightened uh, level of violence in schools in the 1980s uh, uh, and the detention of the leaders in uh, organizations like COSAS forced a lot of the women and men to leave the country, especially after 1976. And the story of uh, Numfundi Sokulati, who grew up in Grahamstown, is an example of the typical kind of narrative of the woman who would leave the country, who she was detained at the age of 16, and she could not sleep at home uh, uh, because she was running away from the police. You know, when she says, I do, I, you know, I do not know how many um, backyard, backyard shacks uh, are sleeping in other people's uh, backyards in Grahamstown, evading the police. 
And so eventually she decided um, that it was best to, uh, to leave the country. I argue that this is a, a common narrative uh, for the young people involved um, in the, especially in the 1980s and late 70s. Uh, and I wanted to say something about the significance of underground work in understanding the different components of struggle in South Africa. Because often uh, what I found in my work was that um, it was not only that people were active in schools, young, uh, women were active in schools, but there were also people who were involved in the underground operation of the ANC and of course the PAC. And when that work got even more riskier, when some uh, women got arrested, um, it was uh, their only option was to then eventually leave the country, either to join MK or do uh, something else in the liberation movement. But what is significant for me is that uh, the role of people like uh, Nondwe Mankasa uh, in the 1970s uh, is often uh, erased in, 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 in uh, ANC's MK history, in part because the people that were at the center of the uh, of the of the uh, uh, sorry I'm panicking about time now uh, you know was assisting in the sabotage campaigns uh, are often not seen as combatants today because they didn't leave uh, the country um, to be trained in places like Angola in places like the Soviet Union. So someone like Nondwe Mangasha, who had worked in PE with Govan Begi, with Raymond Mshaba, is today not seen as a combatant, even though she was there in the inception of, the, of MK and its sabotage campaigns in the Eastern Cape. Uh, but most recently, there is more recognition to her in that she's been uh, awarded the Order of Lutuli. Uh, but the other people that I spoke to, uh, people like... Um, Pumza, Dr. Pumza Janti, who is the current MEC of Health in the Eastern Cape, who was in, also in the underground uh, and then uh, left the country and eventually was trained uh, in Cuba. Uh, and of course, uh, perhaps we'll speak to this herself, as Makosa Zanakaba, uh, who was part of the Natal underground unit, uh, working in uh, Swaz moving between Durban, Natal, and Swaziland working in the underground operative that was run by people like Rony Castle, Jacob Zuma, and Sipiwe Nyanda. Uh, the, point, uh, the reason I'm making this point is that, as someone like Raymond Satner argues, is that there is often the temptation uh, to say that there were the, the spaces between inside South Africa and outside were very separate. But the people who were working in the underground operatives were always moving in between South Africa and Swaziland, South Africa and Lesotho, so South Africa and Botswana. So in many ways, the different sites of struggle were always connected. Um, and the narratives of Kaba and others shows us that. And, and I am going to conclude soon around how the nature of the war itself, again, inside and outside South Africa puts into question women's role in the battlefront. So even though, as Koch agrees, uh, um, that women in the MK were trained, received same training as, as their main counterparts, yet there's often a, a distrust or, a, a, yes, a, there's often a hesitance to acknowledging that the women who were in MK were, were active in combat. So Jacqueline Cox's work uh, interviewed women in MK and white women in the South African Defense Force. And she argues that even though it was an unorthodox war, women in MK were not active in direct combat. And I challenge this idea uh, by arguing that most of the um, uh, operations in MK were not direct combat. Very few of the male or women combatants in MK came in direct con confrontation with the apartheid state. So why is it that there's an assumption that women would have been involved in direct combat? And yet, more than that, to also recognize that a lot of the underground work and the, uh, the work of infiltrating combatants from places like Swaziland to South Africa was done by women combatants. So Toti Mamela's role in Operation Vula shows us the nature of combat 
uh, under the context of guerrilla war. So Dodzi Mamela is the person who infiltrated uh, Mark Maharaj and Sipiwa Nyanda in South South Africa for MK's last operation. What Sapna and others, and I argue this, because, uh, and I interviewed Mamela, um, that the, her work is an example of the kind of very dangerous work that any combatant would have been doing because she needed to sh make sure that the routes that uh, Nyanda and Maharaj were going to take were safe. And so how is it that then we contest that these women combatants were in the battlefront? And to finish off, I want to then talk about the young women who did not manage to escape the country. Um, and gain training in places like Angola and Tanzania and elsewhere. Because I argue in the work that the focus on the role of women in MK does not allow us to realize that the majority of women, old and young, fought the armed struggle inside South Africa. So the typical woman you see, a young woman you see in a film like Sarafina, uh, is the kind of... Um, a person that I call an in-betweener in the sense that they are in between sort of the combative mother and the guerrilla girl. And that often in the literature around the township uprisings, these women are written out. When we talk about young lions, we don't often imagine that the young lion was a combatant. And I build here on Janet Cherry's work that says these young women were doing similar and more roles uh, as their male counterparts. And what I saw when I uh, interviewed young women who were active as part of Amabucho in PE is that one of the roles that they would do is to be marshals at funerals. So one of the work I tried to do in mapping out the spaces of violence is to also look at the, at, a, at the space of a funeral as a, as a space of struggle. And here I build on the work of Mampela Rampele, who says, in the 1980s, in the 70s, the funeral was not just for the family. The funeral was a space of political struggle. So when then, when Mandela dies and people say, we don't do these things at funerals, it's ahistoric. It doesn't quite work like that. But the work that Mampela uh, uh, does, which is important, is to make the argument that women, uh, political widows in a sense, were bringing life to the dead male hero. One of the other people that I thought about in that imagery was the description that someone like Mark Hefise gives of um, Omamu Epanet Mbeki, who had to publicly mourn uh, her, her husband, even though their marriage had dissolved uh, many years before he died. So in a sense, for me, she also presents that image of the political widow. But I argue that, of course, this, this work is important, and we see that in the funeral of the Craydog Four, the role that has been assumed by the widow of Matthew Goniwe, Nyameka, uh, um, Nyameka Goniwe, in a sense, she if I work on Ram, Ram, uh, Mampela's frame, she is the extension, she is the live embodiment of Matthew Goniwe. As, so she argues that the performance or the grieving itself was gendered in those ways. But paying attention to the role of young people, I was struck by something that Nyameka Goniwe said about the role of young people at the funeral of the Craydog Four, and, and, and the fact that they were the ones who were, set, who were being defiant, who were, in a sense, sending a message to their party state that we are not defeated. <coughs> the women I spoke to in PE, all of them were at the funeral of the Cray Dog Four. And many of them were not only at that funeral, they had carried uh, coffins in PE and all over Eastern Cape uh, as part of their role uh, 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 in, 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 you know, uh, in defeating, uh, in sending a message to the state. And so part of their own role was to protect the communities um, and alert them when the police were coming. Uh, and so the story of uh, the, uh, the, this example of Fundi Swamenzeni who says, you know, we, 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 we basically carried coffins everywhere.
you know, shows that the, the, there was no space in South African life um, that was outside of the politics and the violence of the apartheid state. And the role of young people was instrumental in creating or in making the space of the funeral a, a space of combat and a space of defiance. Oh, uh, I think maybe I'll skip this for the discussion. I'll skip this for the discussion. Okay, so really the, the, the argument I wanted to make today is that if one takes seriously the, the nature of the apartheid struggle, uh, we begin to appreciate the ways in which women were foundational in that war. And I argue in the work then that the South African uh, the integration process of the SNDF did not take seriously the unconventional nature of that war. And as a result, for me, as a researcher, um, if I only focused on the state definition of combatant, I would have missed out on the ways in which the majority of women in South Africa, young and old, uh, participated in the armed struggle. And I argue then that this Department of Military Veterans, if we don't contest the representations um, in terms of these definitions of the war itself and who then is recognized as a combatant, uh, women uh, will likely lose out from the material and symbolic benefits. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming, but most importantly, thank you, Sipogazi, for inviting me to come and respond to your most fascinating talk. I met Sipogazi firstly via an email. She was being introduced by a common friend, colleague. And then she came and in, interviewed me in my home. And when she left, said thank you and gave me a pot, a plant in a pot that I kept for about a year, watering, because I was so grateful for the fact that she, she was interested in this kind of work because as somebody who was part of this whole big mess, I think it's important work. So thank you very much, Spogas. So I thought I would just respond mostly to the chapter where you discuss women the chapter that's about guerrilla girls, combatant mothers, and the in-betweeners, but also just pick on things that seemed to move off the page as I was reading your thesis. They seemed to lift up without necessarily thinking about any particular logic, and they speak to what I am concerned about as a woman who was in MK. So the first thing I want to speak about is the multiple voices of silence, because somewhere in your thesis you talk about silence. And I want to talk about the point about being unboxable, considering your three categories. I want to talk about militarism and feminism. I want to talk about women, invisibility, and power. And in relation to all of those, I'll ask some questions at the end. So the multiple voices of silence. I want to start with a poem that I wrote in 2011 which was for me a response to the TRC and its problematics. The poem is called Some Stories. Some stories don't want to be told. They disappear like feces into a pit latrine. They metamorphose, turn darkness into a friend, wear anonymity as a cloak, embrace burial as closure. How does silence speak? When Sipogazi approached me, I had initially been approached by three different people asking me to tell my story of MK. One was writing a book, the other one was doing a movie, I think the other one was, doing, was studying. And all of them were white, and I said no. Yes. And why did I say no? 
I said no because I saw that as a continuation of what I had lived under in apartheid, where it was very common to find white people accessing stories, interpreting them, controlling them, and using that information as their own power. And so I did not want to contribute to that kind of racial skewing of who owns the information, who is controlling it, who is interpreting it, who has power. Now, that was a very difficult thing to do because I want my story to be told. Who doesn't, right? We all want our stories to be told. But I said no. So for me, this is a way of silence speaking in a strategic way. It was in a protective way for myself. It was politi political because I'm reversing the power relations. And it's feminist because I'm a woman. And I can say I remember that two of those three people were men and one was a woman. So when Sipogazi approached me, I said, yes! <laughs> I did not think. I just said, yes. She's a black woman. So here is a situation where a black woman is going to do what she's just done. Yeah. Did you just see? <laughs> and I wanted to give that power and share it with a black woman, however small my story is. Because we all contribute in our small little ways to the bigger picture. So once again, thank you. Now, if you look at this photograph, this is me in an area of the Natal Midlands. This is the first training that I got as an MK operative, underground person. And the reason I had, I was screaming to be trained is because I had been expelled from Ongoe University where I had been studying. Why? Because on the 29th of October, 1983, Inkata soldiers came to campus and we as students were saying no, because we're saying no to the usage of the university campus as a tribal space, because they were wanting to celebrate whatever. And we, I was an activist then, we tried to get an interdict, so they arrived on that Saturday morning and a lot of us were injured. By the end of the day, three students had died and somebody else had died. It's a story that doesn't get told a lot. When you Google it, you just see Ongoye Massacre and a few paragraphs that don't tell the story. So after that incident, I, because I had been active already, I was selected as one of the people in the crisis committee that was to manage that situation. So part of that really changed the kind of activist I had been because that event on the 29th of October, 1983, made me to be prepared to die. And everything changes when you're ready to die. So using the people I knew at the time, I was given a commander. And here we were, three of us. The other one was an, another woman who is now a librarian. She was a student then. If you look at that road from behind there, and you look at these rocks, it's a little, it's a hillock, Smolinya Nakuma, that we're sitting at. The commander said to me, bring a picnic basket. If you have a camera, come. We're going out pick on a picnic. So there we were on a picnic, Kuleli Kuma, and we could see everything and anything from a distance. So we had guns in the picnic basket, and we're learning what to do. So, I'm, so in response to what Sipogaz was saying earlier about how almost impossible it is to box a lot of these things and the way that the, the guerrilla war was happening, we did that at that event, at that sport, and we were never, ever meeting in the sp same sport, ever. And that was the nature of the work that we did. I was reading because I didn't want to look in the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember what that was. So when I looked at the categories that Sipogazi speaks about, the guerrilla girls, the combatant mothers, and the in-betweeners, I was trying to fit myself somewhere. You know how sometimes it's very comfortable to be in a nice box? I thought, OK, I first trained as an MK person in South Africa. 
as part of the underground, um, the Natal machinery, machinery. I didn't know that word at that time. I was just doing the work that I was doing. I only learned about it later. When I was in Swaziland, I was just meeting the one person and then moving to another spot and meeting the one person and doing whatever I needed to do, carrying money on my whole body. I didn't know I was part of a machinery, but that's what I did. But most of my work before I left was youth activism, student activism. I was still in South Africa when the UDF started. I was at Tongoy University. And after I was expelled, I was employed. So all the work that I did as an underground operative, I did with money out of my pocket. When I came back from Swaziland with money for other operations, it was to hand it over to other people to do whatever they needed to do. And of course, I didn't know who those people were because I was working through my commander. So when I left in December of 1986, I was headed to Bango. Bango is one of the camps in Angola that was meant to be short term. You're going there, you're getting training, you're coming back, you're doing what you're supposed to do. The route was, it, it was a meandering route. I went via Swaziland, Mozambique, Zambia, and then finally Angola. Came back from there after four months, was in Lusaka, in the underground of Lusaka, and then I got sent to Moscow. And I was there for six months. And then I came back from Mos Moscow. So all this time, I never was in combat. When we're in Lusaka and we're waiting to be sent back home, the expression was, you're waiting for Um China. And when Um China didn't come for me, and I was not ready to just lounge around doing nothing, I went through those commanders and commissars and asked to be demobilized. We didn't use that word, I just said, I want to be out of here. I can't stay underground doing nothing. So that's how I started working with the ANC Women's League. Once I was there, it became very clear that they needed somebody to be quite skilled in journalism. That's how I got sent to the GDR, East, Gen East Germany. And I did a journalism course there. And when I came back, I went and worked at Radio Freedom. So I'm working at Radio Freedom one day. This is past the February 1990. As a journalist, I'd been there when Mandela came and we were very excited. But around end of March, as I'm leaving the studio that we work from, comes Nosipiu in Mabula, Mapisa. She says to me, I need to talk to you. I said, oh, OK. So we get back in, we sit down, and she says, we're looking for volunteers. People are going to come go back home to start working and building the movement in South Africa. We're not looking for people who are going to go and have meetings and come back. Are you ready to go? I said, of course. What kind of question is that? <laughs> so that's how we then went back to Angola to retrain for a month. Because this is 1990, we didn't quite know what to expect. So we needed to just skill up again. So we returned on the 8th of June, 1990. I think for that, I think there were nine of us or thereabouts. And our, our mission, we were called the ANC Women's League Task Force. Our mission was to work towards the first conference that took place in, in, in Kimberley in 1991 and then build the ANC Women's League. And that's what we came here for. So when I look at what I had done and how it happened, I thought, OK, I was neither a girl, because I was already working. I was in my late 20s when I trained. I was not a mother. And I wasn't quite an in-betweener in the way that you had <coughs> described it. But it speaks to what you were saying earlier, the fact that it is so varied and different, the ways in which women and other men were operating in the kind of struggle that we're a part of, in the kind of war that we were a part of. And then I'd like to speak about militarism and feminism, specifically about being at Pango and being in Moscow. The military is hierarchical. In the military, you're given commands, you're given instructions. In the military at Pango, there was a lot of camp, the camp lingo was full of sexism, 
full of misogyny. The kinds of songs that we sang were mostly about male heroes. And there were adaptations of Christian hymns, quite a number of them. I mean, it's quite creative, but why? Why Christianity when we'd been challenging it in South Africa because the apartheid state was claiming to be a Christian state? So those things were making me uncomfortable. And I was a perpetual, in the perpetual minority. At Pango, because it was a small camp, I don't think there were more than 150 during the time I was there, of us in all, but the tent for us women, when it was full, there were five of us. Mostly it was one, two, three, because people were coming and going, coming and going. When I had malaria, I was alone in that tent. When I was in Moscow, there were eight of us who were sent as a group. Seven of them were men. It is extremely difficult to be in that kind of perpetual minority with men and their energy and the way they speak. It's very challenging. It's challenging for me personally because I am more of a collective kind of person. I want to work with groups. I want to work with women. The kind of camp lingo for me needed a cons constant kind of challenge because because we didn't want to expose who we were, which I kind of like understand, people were speaking what might be called Tzotzital, full of Africans and the mix of all these languages. And I refused to speak that language. So I got a nickname, Intelekusha, because I chose to speak English because I was not going to expose the fact that I, my mother tongue is Sizulu because you tried as much as possible to keep an anonymity around you. So, but I didn't care, I continued speaking my English because I refused to be part of that language and contribute in annulling and doing myself, in erasing myself, in demeaning myself. And I really wished that the songs were much more inclusive of women. And so for me, when the ideas of, okay, you're coming back to South Africa, what are you going to do? And we were talking and people were saying, well, maybe we'll do, you know, we'll be in the army. I said, I'm not going to do that. I am going to prioritize formal education. Remember, I had been expelled in my third year. So I went back and finished my degree. We were discussing at length the idea of having at least 30% women when the party list was being put together. And that conversation came to a head at the first consultative conference in Durban because the men in the ANC did not like the idea that we were talking about 30%. It was too high. <laughs> we had that debate and the conference came to a standstill. Mandela had to be called. He came in and he spoke because we were saying no. Yes, I was part of that fight, but I did not want to go and be in the party. Because for me, it's important to be unbeholden, to rely on myself and to rely on my skills. And therefore, when I finished my degree, I chose to be employed outside of MK, outside of the ANC, and my colleagues at that time were going to parliament. And I was happy with that because Owar Tambo had always said, it's important for our ideas and the ways we think about a progressive South Africa to be all over. So it's fine to be employed elsewhere and work there. So I was comfortable, I wasn't conflicted. I just didn't like feeling the feelings I was feeling in this militaristic way that the ANC and MK was operating. And I have continued over the years choosing employment where at least the organizations seem to be committed to a progressive kind of way of thinking about women. I've never been employed in government, and I choose my employment carefully. Then the other theme is women, invisibility, and power. And I thought I'd introduce that theme by reading a poem which I also wrote in response to the TRC called our wounds, our lips. They wanted us to tell and listen before our wounds healed. Mm 
as if they didn't know that the thunder of pain is deafening. They didn't even notice that our lips were sealed. We need to move on, they said, and God laws repealed. They tried to make us believe that the truth was beckoning. We'd prefer waiting, we said, until our wounds have healed. One after the other, others' stories were revealed. In time, the processes and the performances started settling. By then, no one really cared that our lips were still sealed. Naughty stories were unpicked, their multiple layers unpeeled. Some truths were deadening, others left audiences trembling. We watched, firm in our resolve to speak after our wounds had healed. Audiences saw through some perpetrators telling and squealed. The performance had to go on. The world was watching and questioning. By then, no one really cared that our lips remained sealed. Years later, our wounds healed. The truth is our shield. We open up to be heard. For us, this act will be strengthening. After all, today, many seem to agree that before our wounds healed, we could not talk and listen. So here we are today, our lips no longer sealed. So the questions that I have in my mind when I think about women and invisibility and, owning, and women owning their power is, how do women speak about their invisibility? What do we know about how that works? Talking about the advantages of invisibility, there's also the other side. When I was doing the underground work, my cloak of invisibility really, really helped me. The months before I left, I was working at a hospital for white people only. Somebody had told me the matron there needs a qualified nurse, sister to be in charge. I went and interviewed. The matron said to me, would you mind working at night because we're going to be breaking a rule? I really need somebody, but we need you to work at night so that nobody sees you during the day. I said, of course I don't mind, because the advantage of working at night at that hospital is that you work for seven days and you were off for seven days. So what was I doing during the seven days when I was off? Up and down Swaziland. Sometimes I traveled in my uniform. I'm ordinary, I don't look like anything. I just walked in and out of places and my invisibility for me was very protective for that work at that time. But if we're talking about the DDR processes that Sipogaz is looking at, who, devi who defines who's invisible? Who has the power to say, these are the people that are gonna get uh, the, the monetary reward for having been, you know, combatants. And for me, there's a very close relationship between what Sipogazi anal analyzes as the DDR processes to the TRC with regards to definitions. Because my biggest problem with the TRC is the way that it was framed. I don't know how much we remember of the way that the TRC uh, terms of references were terms of reference were framed. It was meant to look only at incidences that started in 1960 until 1990, right? As if apartheid had only started in 1960. It was only meant to look at gross violations of human rights. Now, who defines gross? Okay. It was meant to look at individual violations of human rights. After what Sipolazi has told us and what we knew happened in the way that the war happened. How could you focus on the individuals? It was chaired by an archbishop, and it focused on reconciliation. <laughs> what would have happened if it had been chaired by a judge and focused on justice? 
So I think it's very problematic when people who position themselves and take certain uh, liberties to define and describe terms of references, I think it becomes very, very problematic and messy. And often those people are men and women are on the periphery. So the question that's in my head is what does it mean to reverse invisibility beyond the DDR process for the women that Sipogazi is talking about? But just for me, what's important for me is to exercise my personal power all the time, consistently. And it often means going against the grain. So the questions then Sipogazi, I mean, just broadly is, I'm curious about how women speak about their chosen or not silences at different stages of their participation. Because what I was sharing earlier, I want to believe is common. But how did women speak about it? In your thesis, you talk about the fact that there is no clearly agreed upon definition of what a combatant is. My question is, because of the work that you've done, what's your definition of a combatant? The next question is, would you agree with my claim that I'm unboxable if you look at those three categories? The guerrilla girls, the combatant mothers, and the in-betweeners. Because initially when I started, I thought, oh, I'm an in-betweener, and then I went and read, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then how did the interviewees speak about or refer to feminism within these categories? Did they speak about it at all? What was the common thread, if you like? And then lastly, besides the DDR processes, how do women deal with or speak about invisibility, trauma, and their own power? And I've added trauma at the end here because I think it's such a broad thing and it requires its own time, but we can't ignore the fact that a lot of this came with trauma. I've been speaking about my invisibility and how it helped me. I haven't spoken about the trauma side of it. And I think it's a big other subject and the risks that were involved. So that's where I end. of the house. Um, firstly, thank you so much, Dr. Magadla, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's a great honor to be, to be a part of this fantastic panel. And so I'm not too sure how I'm going to fare here, right? Uh, but please do bear with me. Um, first of all, I'm not cool enough to have slides, but I will try and <laughs> I will try and, um, and take you through my responses. Um, as thoroughly um, as I can. I must say that my response to this paper and my interaction with this, uh, with this paper is very much influenced by my lived experience and how, um, as a born free, I've then navigated post-apartheid South Africa, especially in the context where we take seriously that apartheid was a war. Um, so two things I'm going to try and do. The first thing is that I'm going to speak about the three. The, the I'm going to speak about the three different categories that Dr. Makadla gives us, and then ask questions around citizenship and 
uh, what it means. So what it means to be a combatant, and if we're going to talk about being a combatant uh, and the people's war, which means that everyone then is a combatant, what does that mean when we talk about issues of citizenship in the post-apartheid or in the post-war context? And then the second thing that I'm going to try and do um, is I'm going to try, again, because of my lived experience, I'm going to try and have a conversation about how then the, the apartheid war and the legacies of apartheid then influence the way that we then as activists now fight and the way that we then invoke the, t uh, the, the, the type of rhetoric that we invoke and what that does then if we take seriously that the way that the war is fought is the way then that the post-conflict uh, is also is either undermined or aided by the, the way that the war is fought, right? Um, so yeah, let's go into this idea of uh, the, the, the three categories. So if we acknowledge and if we believe that the, our conceptions of war and that our, um, or that war in and of itself is gendered, then we must acknowledge that the conversation around peace or the conversation around peace building or our transition in 1994 is gendered. Mm -hmm. We must then agree that the era that we live in now, which is the post-apartheid uh, era, is gendered. Um, and so then I want to look at, um, so we have the three categories that Dr. Makatla has given us, which is the guerrilla girls, the combative mothers, and the, um, the in-betweeners. I want to ask questions then around the DDR processes uh, that happened in our transition and that continue to happen throughout um, throughout the e e democracy. How those processes then, how do the in-betweeners and the combative mo mothers specifically access those processes? Are they even part of that conversation? If we're going to argue that apartheid was a people's war, then we have to argue, and, and if we're going to acknowledge that the the way in which apartheid was fought was incredibly intimate, was in our own spaces, in our communities, in our homes, then we have to argue that those spaces are milit milit militarized. Have then those spaces been demilitarized? Have those spaces been demobilized? Has there been rehabilitation? Has there been reintegration uh, if, if, when we speak about um, township and the townships and those spaces? And as Ndomba Zania said, I can tell you then that the way that we, uh, the, the way that, um, Sorry, my thoughts. The way that uh, we continue to fight right now or to have like service delivery protests or uh, whatever the fight is about, I can tell you very clearly that the reaction from the state is still quite similar to the reaction of the apartheid state. And so how do we talk about demobilization and demilitarization of the women who had babies on their backs and guns in their hands who still then have to face the same state repression that they did when they were in that context right now. Can we then seriously say that there's been a process of demobilization or demilitarization? How then do we have a conversation about demilitarizing those spaces? And what does that look like? Because the very people who are part of, make, uh, or who are part of making the homes, the churches, and the schools battlefronts are still very much alive right now. Um, and, so, um, and so, yes, um, when it comes then to the uh, bitter contestation between the nationalist agenda and the feminist agenda, how then, do, um, how, how, how then can we have a conversation about a transition if the transition didn't prioritize any of the three people that you talk about um, uh, uh, in your paper and didn't prioritize any uh, women who are then part of that very intimate um, that very intimate fight with apartheid. Um, and so it brings me to a question about then who, ha who um, gets to talk about demilitarization and demobilization? Who gets to talk about what the transition or what the transformed South Africa looks like? And if that conversation does not prioritize 
women and does not pr prioritize what you call, what you then term in between us, um, for example, how, how much then can we say that there has been a, I don't know what to call it, a full transition? It, like, so have all the spaces received this sort of transition? And the reason I want to link this to citizenship then is I want to, um, I don't know, argue, I want to argue that if we're going to say that this was the people's war, then we're going to say that everyone was a combatant. And we're going to say that specifically the spaces where the most violent and the most resistance to that violence was felt are our communities and our homes, then when we, when we have a, a, like a state-centric idea of what a combatant is, then we have a problem because then it means that those, uh, the, the, the state-centric definition of what a combatant is then leads to the state-centric definition of what a citizen is and therefore has access to the Department of uh, military, um, Defense and Military vet Veterans, right? Which means that the people who are in the location who um, fought very intimately um, with, with the apartheid state then don't have access to that. And I'm, I'm arguing that that's a form of limitation to, citizen, to citizenship or to like access to citizenship, right? Um, and so, yeah. So I think that when, when we have a conversation around um, DDR and when we have a conversation around what the battlefront actually is, I think as South Africa, we need to take very seriously that we haven't demobilized, that we haven't uh, demilitarized those spaces. It's why then we can have a conversation about South Africa having a culture of violence. Let's not ignore where that culture of violence then comes from in terms of the lack of demobilization. Okay, so yeah, uh, I'm going to then now um, talk about I hope that makes sense. I'm going to talk about um, our our more recent student more recent student movements and the and the and the type of rhetoric that we invoke. And so, if again, if we're going to say war is gendered, the conversation around peace is gendered, then the post-conflict or the post-war is gendered. My issue then is an issue of legacy here. So. Um, our immediate or our knee-jerk reaction is to sing the same songs that Om Susu Kosi sang. And if Susu Kosi can say that those songs were um, alienating, uh, the space was incredibly masculine, misogynistic, are we then not, if we're using the same songs, the same heroes, what sort of space are we creating then within our social movements right now? And this is not, this is not a conversation um, about who gets to be a competent after this must fall in 10 years when I write my PhD, hopefully. <laughs> God willing. <laughs> so this is... So this is not a conversation about who gets to be a combatant or who gets to be the revolutionary, right? This is a conversation about the th reproducing and really English to say that it's not coming. <laughs> um, yeah, so if we're going to reproduce the methods and the conditions with, uh, within which we fight, surely then we're going to reproduce the post-conflict of that fight. Um, and so I want to look at, um, and as, as I was reading um, through your thesis, conversations around women and queer bodies who occupy the space of FMF, or rather the fallist movements, um, and the sort of rhetoric that has been surrounding that conversation, and the refusal of the men specifically within those spaces to have that conversation. And the, the Ebo Jaminis of this world and their conversations around um, how they will treat women during the Chimurenga. Um, and I think, again, this is simply like um, an example, or these are examples of us reproducing those same masculine spaces, those same alienating spaces. And so, um, especially, um, taking very, very seriously um, our reference list. 
as a and I would and I'd like to argue that our reference list was a response to that sort of masculine um, that hyper masculine or hyper uh, that violent sort of space if we take seriously then things or protests like our reference list we need to take seriously then the role that men so <sighs> the role that men play within that pro within that protest for example here I want to talk about the fact that the women within who are fighting the violence and who have found allies in their comrades, in their brothers, are being raped by the very same comrades. How then do we have a conversation about, uh, about changing those spaces and about changing the way that we fight and therefore changing what the post-conflict looks like when that's still our very reality? Um, and so, yes, here I just want to bring, um, bring up the point, or rather just point to the argument of masculinity and re-invoking and reproducing masculine spaces within what we call our more progressive movements and point to the danger of then doing this. Because I would think that we wouldn't want to repeat um, the sort of mistakes that our uh, parents, grandparents who fought um, the, in, as in the anti-apartheid movements would have, uh, uh, sorry, we wouldn't want to repeat the same mistakes and have the same sort of results that come from those toxic mascul mascul masculine spaces within the South Africa that we are trying to reimagine and that we are trying to rethink. And so it's important then for me, as I conclude, that we have a very serious conversation about the, the, the nature of war and if our conception of war is still in this very gendered, binary um, type of conception, then we have a problem. We need to, um, and I think Dr. Magadla's work does quite a bit to then break excuse me, break those um, barriers in terms of talking about battle spaces, about battlefronts, and um, talking about intimate spaces uh, being battlefronts and, and, uh, being, uh, and people within those spaces being active agents of war. I think in post-apartheid, which is I'm going to call post-war South Africa then, we need to take seriously the conversation then around what that, um, so that the, what the legacy of that war is and what um, our DDR processes specifically then do for our communities and for the categories, for the women who fall into and the unboxable women, um, what those processes do um, for those people and how that then affects the societies that we live in. So, so.